Chapter 2, Section 2, Graphs of Functions. Okay, so in this section we're going to be looking at functions by plotting points, um, graphing piecewise defined functions, uh, vertical line tests, uh, and then which equations represent functions. All easy things, I think. Okay, the most important way to visualize a function is through its graph. Uh, like I said, uh, there's a lot of value to being able to look at the graph of a function. Uh, we get to see the relationship between the input and output variables in an easy way. It's an easy way to interpret that relationship. And one of the first ways that we learn to graph anything is just by plotting points, right? Um, so we uh, we find ordered paired solutions to the to the equation that's provided or the relationships that's provided, uh, typically through an equation. Um, and if it's not an equation, you probably want to take the first step is to write it in the form of, a, of an equation if possible. Um, and then graph those ordered pairs. Uh, and uh, from there, hopefully, a pattern uh, a useful pattern might merge. So a function f of the form f of x equals to mx plus b is a linear function as we've been working with already, uh, because it's the graph of its uh, because the graph of the equation y equals mx plus b, which represents a uh, which represents a line with slope m and y intercept. Uh, this author keeps doing this. It's not y intercept b. It's y intercept zero comma b. Y intercept. 0, comma, b. Um, and then we have a special case, linear code occurs with m equals to 0. OK, so let's let's look at those, right? So this is all linear equations uh, of the form y equals mx plus b. y equals mx plus b. And now with our newfound function notation, it's f of x equals mx plus b, right? And that's where this guy represents the slope the angle of the line, and this value here, 0, comma b, and uh, represents the y-intercept. Uh, so let's look at that family of functions. Okay, so let's look at Desmos again. So again, for, uh, for the, those of you who didn't see yesterday's uh, class, it's Desmos, D-E-S-M-O s.com and then you choose calculator and you get to this uh, so linear equation so y equals to say 3x plus uh, 3x plus 2 is a linear equation where the slope is 3 right so this the the steepness of this line is identified by this 3 and 0 comma 2 is the y-intercept here uh, and as we change the slope so that the slope changes from 3 to um, 8 it gets steeper. If the slope changes to something like a really small decimal, like 0 0.01, then it uh, gets less steep. At 0, it becomes a horizontal line. And then if we have a negative value, like negative 1, uh, then the, the, the angle goes down this way. Remember, think of it as like a little stick person walking from left to right, going downhill, therefore the slope is negative. We can create with this guy a variable or actually, let's go with m, like this. And now, this little value m, the slope, is um, evaluated by this little slider here. So you can see that as I move this, and I make m larger and larger and larger, like right here it's 3, and then larger and larger and larger, like here it is 5. So as we go in this direction, the steepness climbs that way. And then we go all the way back down to 0, and then it's horizontal. And then as we go this way, Become steep in the other direction, right? A very big, 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 and it keeps going, 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 going. Um, and then the other variable here is the b. The b determines the y-intercept, which is this guy right here. And let's label it as a point. Um, so we'll call it b. Label it, right? and then so that's the y-intercept, zero comma one. And as I slide this up or down, it changes where it crosses the y-axis. So with a combination of these two things, we're able to graph almost everything. The only thing we can't graph this way, the only thing that's not really defined by all of this, is vertical lines, right? Vertical lines are a unique case. So even though the slope can get really, 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 really big in the positive direction, right? A very big positive steep value here. Uh, let's, let's go with... Um, let's say we have y equals to... 30x plus 2. 
right, at 30x, the, the slope being 30, it's very steep. Um, I can go even steeper by making this 300, and it's so steep that it almost looks like it's a perfect vertical line, but that's an illusion, right? There's no such thing. This thing is just so incredibly steep, it kind of looks like that, but it's not, right? Vertical lines are not described this way. If, if it was actually a perfectly vertical line, then we have to use this notation, x equals a constant, like say 4. Now that would be a perfectly vertical line um, where where the line is described by just the statement x equals to 4. Good. Remember the slope is undefined for this purple one. Um, moving on over here. Okay, so if we have a linear equation of the form f of x equals to 2x plus 1, then again this is a linear equation with a slope of 2, y-intercept of 1. Here we can see a quick little sketch of it. It's got a, a y-intercept of 0, 1. Here's the equation. If I wanted to find other points, I can use the slope. And this is a really good way of uh, practicing this. Right? The slope is 2, m equals to 2. If we want to uh, use that information to find other points and do a rough sketch, uh, we would like to convert this into a fraction. So we can just always put a little 1 underneath. And now we can use this as the rise. And this is the run. So now we can come back over here and do one unit this way, the run, and then the rise, and the rise goes up to there. So two units that way. And we arrive at another point. So it looks like we go to one and up by two, this is gonna be the point one comma three. This one is a linear equation, that's this way. So f of x equals to three is the same thing as y equals to three. Um, and this one does still stick to the general form of the y equals mx plus b. Right. The only one that doesn't fit that pattern are vertical lines. Horizontal lines do fit the pattern because we can always stretch this to mean 0 times x plus 3. The y-intercept is 0, 3. The slope is 0. So this line right here, the slope is 0. Okay. Um, so any function of the form x equals to the power of n are called power functions. Um, and there are different, there's a, there's a few one, uh, a, a few patterns that we need to, to remember with uh, any equation that fits this form. So the power functions are, so power functions are anything that fits this form. So obviously some of the famous ones, oops, I forgot. X, f of x equals to x to the n power. So most common ones are f of x equals to x to the first power, of course, equals to x squared, f of x equals to x cubed, and f of x equals to x to the fourth, and f of x equals to x to the fifth power. That's all you really need to look at because beyond that, the pattern stays the same. This is going to be a linear equation. In fact, I think, oh, well, that's fine. Um, this is going to be just a linear equation, right? So uh, the, uh, the y-intercept is going to be 0. So a rough sketch of this thing is just going to be the line that goes through the origin. Oh, that failed. Just to go through the origin. This one has a um, slope of 1. Slope equal to 1. Uh, and y-intercept, y-intercept of 0, comma 0. Good. Okay, this one is just a quadratic. Hopefully we're familiar with it. With the vertex equal at 0, it's just a nice common standard function. And its graph is going to look like this. We'll use technology in a little bit and get even better pictures. But this is just a standard graph of a parabola centered at the origin. Good. Um, x cubed is going to look very similar to the parabola. Let's extend it out here. It has this sort of a pattern and comes down this way. So it's kind of like this thing here, but then you just 
twist this down and curve it down in toward the uh, quadrant three. And this is supposed to go through the origin, so that looks kind of ugly there. Uh, that's this guy. And then for these guys, they follow the same patterns as this. They look very similar. So x to the fourth power looks a lot like this one, except it gets more kind of squared off, where, where x to the power of four goes down and kind of becomes a little more squared off. It goes down toward the x-axis faster um, for, um, from the point uh, 1 comma 1. So we have 1 there and 1. And then over here we have the point negative 1. So within this little zone, when we have even powers, powers of 4, 6, 8, uh, this kind of gets squared off a little more and goes toward the x-axis a little bit faster. And then from this point forward, it goes up toward infinity a little bit faster. So it looks more and more like a squared off parabola. The bigger the power, the more it fits that form. And similar for this guy here, uh, at the point 1 and 1. And then over here we have negative 1 and down to negative 1. In this little zone within negative 1 to positive 1, as we go to powers of 5, 7, 9, these things are going to get a little bit more squared off. They go toward the x-axis faster. And then beyond that, they go up to positive infinity or down to negative infinity faster. You can use technology to do a better job of graphing those as well. So y equals to x is just a straight line. Uh, y equals to x to the power of 2 oops, is a parabola like this. Uh, and then as we do different powers, y equals to x to the power of 4, that are all even. See, uh, from the point, um, from this point and this point, from negative 1 to positive 1 along this domain, from within, within there, you see that the graph gets more squared off. It goes down toward the x-axis faster. And then from that point forward, it goes toward infinity faster. Right? So this one is x squared. The red one is x to the fourth. Let's see, y equals to x to the fifth. I'm sorry, x to the sixth it's even more squared off, right? So this is x squared, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, right? And you can see the pattern here, see how it gets more squared off. It goes down toward the x-axis faster. The bigger the power, as long as it's even, it goes down toward the x-axis faster uh, within negative one and positive one. And then outside of those things, it goes toward infinity faster. Uh, so you get this sort of shape, right? So if I pick x to the power of some really big, um, uh, even power, then this thing will almost look like, a, look like a vertical line comes down here. It be, comes down here pretty quickly toward the x-axis. So it'll just look like a like a glass. Like y equals to x to the power of, I don't know, how about 30? See how the green one just looks like a glass? Just it comes down here. It almost looks like a vertical line, but we know better. We know it's not a vertical line, but it almost looks like it. It still goes through the point negative 1, 1 and 1, 1. And then it kind of squares off pretty quickly here. And it almost looks like a flat base here, but it's not. It's just that it approaches zero so fast that to the naked eye, it looks that way. But it's also never really horizontal. It's just a sort of an extreme version of the original black one. OK, y equals to x to the power of 3 looks very similar um, to this one. So here is x squared is this black one. So you see that it, on the in, in quadrant one, they look very, very similar, except x to the power of three between uh, zero and one goes toward the x-axis a little bit faster. That's because three is bigger than two. And we just saw that as the power gets bigger, it goes toward the x-axis a little bit faster. And then from this point forward, x to the power of three goes to infinity a little bit faster. So on, on the right-hand side, it follows the same pattern as before. But on the left-hand side over here, when the input value is negative, uh, raising a negative number to the power of 3 is still going to give us a negative number. So it just uh, uh, allows negative values and comes down here in the quadrant 3. Okay, so let me get rid of this. So this is the iconic graph of x to the power of 3. And then as we go higher in powers that are all odd, x to the power of 5, again we follow the same pattern that between negative 1, between negative 1 and 1 on its domain in that region, the new higher power is going to go towards zero faster. So it kind of squares it off this way and it squares it off that way. And then outside of those regions, the function is going to go toward positive infinity or toward negative infinity faster. Uh, so this is the pattern that emerges. Very similar to the previous one. Y equals to x to the power of 7. Oops. 
the power of 7. You see it's even more squared off. Let's pick another really big one. Uh, y equals the x to the power of 9. Good. So let's zoom in again. So they all go through the point 1, 1. The original one is this purple one. That's x to the power of 3. And then x to the power of 5. And x to the power of 7. And then x to the power of 9. So the bigger the power, the faster it goes toward the x-axis and squares off around here. The bigger the power, the faster it goes toward infinity in this zone over here. Good. They, they all go through the origin, 0, 0. And then they go down in this direction. And again, they all go through this point, negative 1, negative 1. Right, so all, all of these functions, all of them have the same three points in common. Uh, it's just the pattern changes a little bit uh, based on the regions. Right, so through here, they're still negative, but they go toward the x-axis faster and faster and faster, depending on the power. And then as we go farther into this direction, the bigger the power, the faster it goes toward negative infinity. Uh, all right, moving on. So let's look at... So we looked at x squares, we looked at x cubes. Um, what about the square root function? Uh, the square root graph um, can also be written this way, remember, that h of x equals to the square root of x is the same thing as x to the power of 1 half or x to the power of 0 0.5. It just makes it easier to graph that way. So again, let's just use Desmos. So most things. So we have y equals to x to the power of 0 0.5. Yeah. So this is the pattern that we get for the square root, 1 over 2. And then if we look at y equals to the cube root, how would we do the cube root? Um, so that would be y equals to x to the power of, and then the cube root would be 1 divided by 3. So the purple one is the cube root. So they are very similar to looking at the powers of 2 and the powers of 3, just kind of tilted on their side. And then moving forward, uh, the same pattern happens where if we have, um, let me rewrite this as 1 half so it kind of fits the pattern, power of 1 divided by 2. Okay, so here's the 1 half one. If we do 1 fourth, 1 sixth, 1 eighth, all the even ones, they will be similar to this green one. Y equals to x to the power of 1 divided by 4, except this squared off thing happens again, but in a different direction. Good. So the green one is just the square root of 2, and this one is the fourth root of, I'm sorry, the square root of x. This one is the fourth root of x, and if I go to the sixth root, it'll just kind of come up here and be a little more squared off. It still goes through this point and then goes um, uh, below this black line over here. So, um, that's the pattern that happens with all the even roots. And then all the odd roots will follow this pattern, where this is the cube root of x. And then if I use the fifth root of x, the seventh root of x, all of them we know are going to go through the this. Come on. Why aren't you? Why is it fighting? Okay, well, it's going to go through the point negative 1, comma, negative 1. I don't know why it doesn't want to keep it. Anyway. Um, and then if I use a different power, like the fifth root of x, it's going to get more squared off here. It's going to go this way, go through the point 1, 1, and then go up slowly. This direction, it's going to go this way, uh, a little bit more squared off, and hit 1 there, and then go this way. y equals to x to the power of 1 divided by 5. We get that. Graph these functions by creating tables. Okay, so tables. Um, if you didn't have these patterns memorized, if you've never seen them before, how would we know that this was a, a parabola and this was um, the, the, the graph of a x cubed? Well, we start off by creating tables, creating ordered pairs, and from those ordered pairs, we'd uh, establish the patterns, right? So you can, again, use technology to speed up the process, but we can get a couple going. So if someone had no idea what this was and how to graph it, why not just start evaluating um, input values. So 0, 0 squared gives you 0, and then 1, and then 1 squared, that gives you 1, and 2 and 2 squared, that gives you 4, right? So you can just keep going that way. Uh, negative 1 and negative 1 squared, that gives you 1, and negative 2 and negative 2 squared, that gives you 4, right? And so you can just keep going this way, keep going that way, and establish a pattern. So, uh, what? let's go this way. 
Okay, so let's go back to this. What we could do is establish a table. There's tables, tables. Equals x two. Hmm. There we go. Okay, so we can just graph a bunch of results. Um, so if I had no idea what x squared was, I can create a little table like here uh, and just plug in values. So the value of one is mapped to one because one squared is one. So here's my little dot. How about zero? Zero maps to zero, okay, so then we get this one. Negative one squared is one, so we get this one in there. So we can just keep going and try and find values. Two maps to four, and then of course negative two also maps to four, so we get that point over there. And we can keep going, and it doesn't have to be just whole numbers, I can try some decimals. Point two, point two squared is point zero four, so that's how we get this value right here. Um, how about point five? about uh, 1.5, how about negative 0. 0.7, how about negative 1.4. So we can just keep going, you know, find more and more values. And as you can see, we're starting to fill in the pattern that we're looking for. And as I do this uh, an infinite number of times, eventually we start to see that all of these form this pattern. Whoa, I just designed it, that pattern. Eventually all those little dots uh, begin to form this shape, right? So when you see a graph like this one, a parabola, um, it's it's useful to sometimes think of it think of it as an infinite uh, an infinite collection of dots that form that graph, right? An infinite collection of ordered pairs that establish the relationship between the horizontal variable and the vertical variable. Good. We can do the same thing for x cubed. We can do the same thing for the square root of x. We can create a table evaluate this uh, equation for different input values, get an output value, graph all of these ordered pairs, and eventually you see that we get the, uh, the, the, the shapes, graphs of those functions. So here they are. Good, questions, comments, issues? Okay, piecewise functions, easy stuff. So sometimes a function is defined um, differently for different parts of the domain. Um, so here's an example of what it might look like. Here we have a function f of x, which is defined, described by this relationship whenever the input value is this, whenever uh, x is strictly less, of, less than or equal to one, um, this is the, the function that describes it. Whenever x is greater than, strictly greater than one, then this is the equation that defines it. So in order to graph these, you're gonna have to graph both of them and then chop it up based on the domain break it up based on the domain. Good, so we know that the equation of x squared is just gonna be a plain boring parabola. So I know this guy goes this way, and this guy goes that way. So this is x squared. Um, and then two x plus one, so this is y equals to two x plus one, tells me the slope is two. and it goes to the point zero comma one as the y-intercept. This guy over here, okay, so zero comma one, let's say it's there, and then as it goes through slope of two, I don't know, maybe it goes like that, something like that. Good, okay, so now what happens at one? So at one, this gives you the point one comma one. At one, this gives you the point uh, one comma three. So um, at one we have one comma one. Looks like I have let's make an open circle. That one is one comma three. And then at one we have the point one comma one over here. Uh, well, let's see. That's one comma one for the parabola. Okay, so um, according to these instructions, if the input variable x is less than or equal to one, less than or equal to one, we follow these instructions. Right, so we're gonna have, 
uh, for x less than or equal to 1, strictly, I'm sorry, yeah, less than or equal to 1, we're going to follow the parabola. So that's going to be this thing over here, going over here in green. And for 1, uh, for x being greater than or equal to 1, we're going to follow uh, these instructions. So it's going to be this open circle there. Um, and then we're going to go this way. And looking at this, we need a, a closed circle there and then an open circle there. Okay, so we would at this point erase everything else and our graph would just be the green part. It's, a, it's that part there made up with this part over here. Yep. So you have to graph them both. You have to think about uh, the domain and um, break up your graphs based on the domains. And think about where they equal each other or what happens at the points where the, the domains um, intersect or something. I'm not sure why that's there. Anyway, here, this is what it would look like. We follow the instructions on the parabola up until we get to this value. It's a closed circle. And then we jump over and follow the instructions of the straight line. Right? This would be a straight line that continues this way, but we're only going to have this little ray uh, starting from this point, which was the point 1, 3. Okay, the greatest integer function. Um, it's it's a, quite a useful little function uh, that's described with these little, um, almost like brackets with an extra line through them. Uh, the greatest integer function uh, always equals the biggest integer that is definitely less than or equal to x. So it um, brings it down to the value, the first integer to the left of that number on the number line. That's how you can think of it. So here's some examples. If you plug in a 2 into here, the output is just 2, right? The greatest integer that's less than or equal to it. If we put in a 2.3, the answer is 2. If we put in a 1.9999, the answer is 1. Okay, so it's not rounding. Right, so this often gets confused with rounding, uh, but we're not rounding, otherwise this would just round the two, okay? So it's the biggest integer that's smaller than this. You can think of this as money, right? We have whole number, like bills and coins of some kind, so you're just counting how many bills you have and kind of ignoring the coins. So um, these values just round down to the greatest integer. And it gets a little trickier with the negative ones. Um, this gets a little complicated. But remember that it's always the, the first integer to the left of this number on the number line. Right? That's what it means to go to, uh, to the greatest integer that's less than or equal to that value. So negative uh, 3.5 on the number line. Right? So here is 0, here's 1, here's 2. So if, oh, let's put negative um, 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. Um, so if we're looking at input values of 2.3, so here's 2.3 right over here, then when we apply it into the greatest integer function, this is going to give us a 2. It's the first um, uh, whole integer to the left of that decimal value, right? the biggest integer that's smaller than this one. If we put in a 1.99999, it's going to be like right there, 1.9999. Into the greatest integer function, the answer is going to be one. Right? It's the biggest integer to the left of it. So if we're over here at negative three point five, we always go to the first integer to the left, and so the answer is negative four. And then negative one point five, uh, negative zero point five, we apply it to the greatest integer function, is going to be negative one. Okay, here's an example that uses it. Uh, a global data plan costs $25 a month for the first 100 megabytes and $20 for each additional 100 megabytes or a portion thereof. Okay, so draw a graph of uh, costs of C in dollars as a graph of the number of megabytes X used per month. Okay, so let C of X be the cost of using X megabytes of data in a month. So X is always going to be greater than or equal to zero, right? So you can't use negative megabytes in a in a month, you have to use zero or higher. So its domain is um, values from zero to infinity. Good, okay, so now we can kind of create a table to organize our results and it's gonna be based on the amount of data that we use, right? So we wanna break up the domain. When we use between zero and 100 megabytes, inclusive, right? The first 100 megabytes, we just pay $25. Beyond that, if we use 101, 130, 199, if we use 
any number of megabytes that lands in this uh, section of the domain, then this becomes our new uh, our new bill. It's going to be the original twenty five plus twenty dollars for a forty five dollar bill. If we use between two hundred to three hundred megabytes, then our new bill will be sixty five. Right? Two times uh, twenty plus twenty five, the original twenty five dollar uh, fee. Good. Okay. So now, uh, how do we describe this? How do we graph this? This is often called a stepwise function for obvious reasons, right? It looks like a little, bunch of little steps. But uh, notice that these right here, this graph, describes exactly this pattern right here, which describes this situation. So remember there was a $25 fee for, the, for using anywhere between 0 to 100 megabytes. So that's what this is saying. If x is any value between 0 and 100, the bill is going to be 25. Um, on the other hand, if we use even one tiny megabyte beyond 100, uh, and notice there's a dark circle here, so at exactly 100 we're still at 25, but anything beyond that, even a tiny little bit beyond that, our bill just jumps up to here. It's not a smooth transition from here to here, it just jumps to the next level, uh, and I believe that that's going to be 45. Right, so again, we, we, we lose precision when we use uh, graphs, because someone, if, if I just presented this to someone, it might be hard for them to figure out what does this mean? Um, what exactly, what value is that exactly? But uh, we do gain some perspective in that we get to see sort of a global pattern that happens. So there's some benefits to graphs, of course, some, some drawbacks as well. Okay, the vertical line test, super easy. Um, so the vertical line test, a vertical line test is a, a little test we can uh, very easily apply to a graph to be able to, to determine if that graph is the graph of a function, if it qualifies as a function. So a curve is uh, in the coordinate plane is the graph of a function if and only if no vertical line intersects the curve more than once. That's all we do. I'm sure we've all used it before. So here's some examples. If we have this blue graph, what we want to do is visually inspect it. Think about this, this uh, line sweeping back and forth, back and forth. And we're going to keep, be keeping track of how often or where does it um, cross our, our curvature. Right, so if it only touches it at one point at a time, no matter where, as you slide it, it only touches it at one point at a time, then the curvature is the curve of a function. On the other hand, if the curvature does something like this thing here, and then as you sweep this line back and forth, uh, you notice that it touches at more than one place at the same time, for example here, uh, then we can say that it fails the vertical line test and that this curvature is not the graph of a function. Why is that? Well, remember that um, in order for a, a, um, a relationship between an input and output variable to qualify as a function, it must be true that each input gives you uh, one unique output. Right? We saw that yesterday. That's, that's the definition of a function. Um, so when we're looking at these curvature here, right, this blue curvature, it's useful to think of it as an infinite number of dots where each dot represents a relationship between an input Right? When I input the number, I don't know, 3, maybe it outputs the number 7. Right? So there's that relationship, and it's described by this ordered pair right in there. Right? I just made up these numbers just to establish that relationship. Um, and remember that for it to be a function, it must be true that every single input must go to an output. It's okay if more than one input leads to the same output, because notice that if we go over here, here's another number, I don't know, maybe 8. 8 leads to 7. But so does 3 leads to 7. That's okay. And in fact, maybe this one also leads to 7. Uh, maybe that's the number 3.5. 3.5 leads to 7. 3 leads to 7. 8 leads to 7. That's okay. These are all fine. What we cannot have is a case where the same value goes to two different outputs. So let's say, for example, here we have 3. And then according to this graph, it leads to 7. Okay, 3 leads to 7. But also 3, going up here, 3 also leads to 9. Right? So 3 leads to 7, but 3 also leads to 9. That's not a function, right? Not allowed. Can't have that. No, that's too messy. You can't have um, a case where the input value goes to two different outputs. Yeah? This should be really easy. There's no um, mathematical equation, right? It's just a concept we have to keep in mind. So if you're thinking about your homework, how is this going to be applied? Well, they'll just give you a bunch of um, equations, like, I mean, sorry, a bunch of graphs like this, and you just have to look at them and determine which ones would qualify uh, to be the graph of a function. Right? So for part A, right, as we sweep this back and forth, we can clearly see 
that it's going to touch the curvature at more than one spot in lots of places. And so therefore, this is not the graph of a function. Right? It's some sort of oval or circle or something. Um, so it's, it's, not a, it's not the graph of a function. As we sweep a vertical line in this function, we see that it's only ever going to touch uh, one point at a time. So b is the graph of a function. c, same thing, as we sweep a line through there, uh, we see that it only touches uh, one point, point at a time. Right? So as we kind of think about these vertical lines, okay, it touches there. If I do a vertical line as it sweeps, it only touches there. There's no vertical line where it fails. So this is the graph of a function. Um, and then clearly it fails for this last one, so not a function. So just to clarify, this is not a function. This is a function. This is a function. This is not a function. Okay, which equations represent functions? Okay, sometimes that can get a little confusing. Um, if an expression is given to you and you're, you're asked to determine whether it's the equation of a function, uh, a useful thing to do is to first of all uh, spend some time using our awesome algebra skills to convert it in uh, solve for y. Uh, and once you've solved for y, hopefully it's a little easier to determine if it's the equation of a function. And remember the guiding rule again is that every time we input one value, the output is uniquely determined. Um, one of the ways that uh, we will often see this fail is if the y has an even power like say 2, 2 plus x minus 3 equals 4x. Let's say we have something like this. As I try and solve for y, I know that, okay, I'll move this over there, move that over there. I'll end up with y squared equals to 3x plus 3. And now I'm going to have to take the square root of both sides. And when I take the square root of both sides, I know I'll end up with a plus or minus square root of 3x plus 3. Right, this plus or minus out in front tells me that there's going to be two different answers. When I input x and x value, there'll be two different outputs. So I can already tell that this is not going to be a function. That's good. So solve for y, and hopefully it'll be clear there whether or not you'll uh, be able to um, um, preserve the principle of a function. Good. So not every function works. Okay, so. Uh, let's look at this example. As I solve for y, I can tell that I'm going to be able to get the equation of a function. This is just going to be x squared plus 2. Every input gets squared plus 2. That defines a unique value. So this is going to be a function. Right? In fact, it's a parabola, something squared, plus 1. So what happens when I take uh, a parabola and always add 2 to every output? It's going to shift the whole thing up. So let's, let's look at that. I was just looking at this. So here is a parabola of y equals to x squared. Uh, and if we always add 2, let's look at a table value where we always add 2. Okay, so the black one is x squared. And then these little red dots are going to be x squared plus 2. So x squared should have taken me to 1 when we, in, when we input a value of 1. 1 squared is 1. But then if we add 2, that automatically moves you up to 3. Uh, 0. 0 should have taken you to 0. 0 gives you a 0 when we square it. But then because we're adding a 2, um, that gets us to 0, comma 2. Good. How about negative 1? Negative 1. Negative 1 now maps to 3. And then we can throw in some decimals to figure out what happens in the middle there. Good. So you can see that it's starting to create that sort of curvature thing, same as this. If I zoom out a little bit more, let's try some larger numbers. How about, how about 2, how about a 3, how about negative 3, how about um, negative 2.6, how about 2.7. Um, okay, so what we start to see is that this guy here starts to become equivalent to this one, but shifted up by 2. Uh, so the whole thing can be graphed like this. y equals to x to the power of 2 plus 2. So eventually all those little dots start to form the same parabola, but the plus 2 shifts it up. Good. Okay, so that's what this is going to be. 
Um, and clearly this does uh, form the graph of a function. It's a parabola. And inspecting it on, on sort of inspe an, uh, on inspection of the equation, every input gets squared plus two, every input gets a unique output. On the other hand, we've worked with these before. This is the equation of a circle. Right? It fits the, the general form of a circle, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals to r squared. Here, um, the h and the k equal 0. So we have a circle centered at the point 0, 0. Right? That's what these tell us. And the radius is going to be 2. Right? 2 squared is 4. So it's just a, a standard circle centered in the origin. And knowing that it's a circle, I already know that it's going to fail the vertical line test. Uh, because as I sweep lines through this, vertical lines through it, I can see that there's going to be an infinite number of places where the line touches at two points. In fact, there's only two points where the graph only touches at one point, where the vertical line only touches at one point. So that would be this point there, that's supposed to be a straight line, and this point here, right? The points where the lines are tangent. At this point and at this point, the vertical lines only touch at one point, but at every other place, uh, the lines touch at more than one point. Good. So this is not a function. Upon inspection, we can also tell that as I solve this, I'm going to end up with um, something of y squared format. I'll end up with y squared equals to 4 minus x squared. And then as I solve for y, I'm going to end up having to do the square root of 4 minus x squared. Again, I get a plus and a minus. There's going to be two solutions. One input is going to result in two outputs. Therefore, I know that this is not a function. Okay, same thing. We um, solve for y. We see that every input has a unique output. Solve for y. We see that we end up having to do the plus or minus. One input is going to end up with two different outputs, the positive end and the negative end. Good. We can graph them, do the vertical line test, and again, we see that... Um, it uh, touches at only one spot at a time as we sweep this left and right. And here it touches at more than one spot. Good. The, the Desmos allow us to see the vertical line test thing a little bit better as well. Uh, let's change this to be black. Let's get rid of this thing. Let's get rid of that guy. Okay, so here is the line, uh, the curvature y equals to x squared plus 2. And let's do the line y equals to um, w b, where b is this slider. Here we go. Let's make it red. And B is right here. Okay, so here is the vertical line sweeping through the function. And we see that as it sweeps through it, it only touches the graph at one point at a time. Um, how do I get it to be equal to that? Equals to comma uh, B to the second power plus 2. Do it that way. Okay, and then we can label it. There we go. Okay, so now as I sweep through, you see that that point, it only touches at one point at a time. Good. And then we do the same thing here, and as I sweep through it, we see that it would touch at more, more than one point at a time. Any questions? No? No? Okay, so um, some classic uh, functions, right? We have linear equations that fit this format. Uh, power functions, we covered this a, a little bit already. Powers of n, the general pattern that happens. Uh, here is uh, x squared, and then all the even-powered ones, like this one, and to the sixth power, and to the eighth power, are going to look like this, just more and more squared off. And all the ones that have an odd power, like x to the third, x to the fifth, and so on, have these general patterns. And there's a couple of other 
uh, common ones. So we briefly looked at roots as well. So all the even roots are going to have this general pattern, and all the odd roots are going to have this general pattern. Good. And then reciprocal functions, we didn't look at these uh, today, but hopefully they look familiar. Again, these are the general patterns. Again, uh, the ones that have an even power have a very similar shape. So 1 over x, um, uh, sorry, 1 over x, 1 over x cubed, 1 over x to the fifth, all the odd ones are going to have a similar pattern, and then all the even ones are going to have a similar pattern. Right? Mainly that the output is never negative when we have an even power. And then the graph of an absolute value equation looks like this, like a V-shape. Hopefully that looks familiar. Uh, and then the greatest integer function, which we covered today. So hopefully these graphs are mostly familiar. I think maybe greatest integer function is new to most people. Uh, but hopefully the other ones are, are familiar. And you know, if, if you're not sure, if you're not quite sure why it has that sort of shape, like maybe you haven't seen the absolute value function before, uh, then Desmos is a great way to convince yourself that that's the graph of an absolute value. So if you come over here and uh, graph it, come on, go away. We can go back to the table format and um, graph a bunch of a bunch of ordered pairs. Okay, so here's a little table of values. 1 leads to 1, 0 leads to 0, negative 1 leads to 1, uh, 0 0.5 leads to 0.5, negative 0.4 leads to positive 0.4. Uh, so that all these ordered pairs, like this one and this one and this one, right, these are the ordered pairs that are described when we create this table for absolute values. And you see that eventually, as we fill in this blank even more, um, say maybe we type in a negative uh, 2.8 or type in a positive 1.9, right? As we create more and more of these dots, eventually they begin to uh, fill in the shape of a y equals of x. They begin to fill out that shape, right? So it looks like a v. That's why the graph of the absolute value function f of uh, absolute value function uh, looks like this v shape.